Hello everyone, welcome to today's webinar. I'm Linda Wang, Senior Editor at Chemical and Engineer News, and I will be moderating today's event. This webinar is titled, An Overview of High Spatial Resolution Detection Solution, using the latest SCMOS and scintillator technology, and is being sponsored by Andor and co-hosted by Carter. CNN works with sponsors to identify topics of interest and value to CNN's audience and consistent with CNN's mission to provide news and analysis of the chemistry enterprise in a timely, accurate, and balanced fashion. During the webinar, you can adjust the size of the slides on your screen by grabbing the lower right corner with your mouse. If you need technical assistance, please look at the help widget at the bottom of the screen or type your query into the Q&A box. If you are disconnected during the webcast, please log in again according to the instructions you received earlier. You are encouraged to contribute to the success of this webinar by asking questions at any time during the presentation through the Q&A box on your screen. The questions will be answered at the, time, at the end of the presentation, and as your moderator, I will be posing as many as time permits. Please note that CNN does not endorse any company products or services that may be mentioned in the webinars, and that each webinar will be archived at CNN Online after the live webcast. Today's presentation is sponsored by Andor and co-hosted by Crider. Andor is a global leader in the pioneering and manufacturing of high-performance scientific imaging cameras, spectroscopy solutions, and microscopy, microscopy systems for research in OEM markets. Crider is one of the world's leading companies in synthetic crystal manufacturing and processing with a strong focus on niche applications and client-specific projects built on high expertise and close cooperation in research and development. During the presentation, we will hear from Colin Duncan, Application Scientist for Physical Sciences Imaging at Andor, and Jerry Pirzek, Technology Application Specialist at Crider. Colin studies physics at Queen's University, Belfast. During his time with Andor Technology, he has worked in a variety of roles, gaining a high level of technical expertise in the area of CCD cameras and astronomical in imaging. Jerry studies physics at Charles University in Prague. His interests lie in optics and optoelectronics, including special applications such as X-ray imaging systems. During his time with Carter, he has participated in projects related to photon counting imaging devices and use of scintillators as imaging screens. I will now hand the presentation over to Jerry. Thank you very much. So let's begin with the presentation. I think that everybody knows x-rays from its own experience with doctors. When you had some accident and you felt pain in your leg or arm, so you went to, you went to the doctor to see if something had happened to your, to your body. So x-rays are penetrative radiation, which were discovered in 1895 and have high energy that starts at 10 electrovolts to 100 keV. Well, the basic uh, operation with x-rays would be radiography. It's imaging of sample structure using radiation. Because they are highly penetrative, you can see actually the composition of the material, the defects and everything, what's hidden to your eyes. There are different configurations. First of all, we can have absorption radiography, which is the, uh, the, the way how your, the doctor actually performs his scan. You have a point-like x-ray uh, source which irradiates the object, and then there's uh, an imaging detector in a certain, in a certain, uh, certain uh, distance behind the detector, and you can image it on an imaging detector. This is the first variant. The second one would be isotopic marker. Then you have a marker here. You put somebody, something to a uh, patient's body, for example, and you are able to measure the radiation which comes from the marker. The third option would be X-ray fluorescence when you irradiate the surface of, a, of some material and you measure the X-ray radiation, the fluorescence, which comes from the surface. So radiography is very handful to many, many people in the world to see the structure of the material. So let's talk about detectors. So we have many detectors for radiography. The oldest one would be film emulsions, which uh, provides very high resolution. Uh, they are very, mm, very cheap but, and have very low noise. But on the other hand, they exhibit a nonlinear response and limited dynamic range. And also, you need some processing to see the image. 
this is the old way. For now, we have different methods which are more sophisticated. The first method would be scintillator and charge integration detectors, such as a CCD camera, CMOS camera, coupled to a scintillator. And this would provide high spatial resolution, also for low price, but some disadvantages would be dark current and noise and limited dynamic range. The third option would be photon counter detectors, which also Kritur has in stock. He's interested in new technology, so scintillators and photon counting is, are the future. And here, there's a good spatial resolution, which is, uh, but, which is uh, lower than with scintillators, but there is no noise, no dark current. But unfortunately, the price is very high for now. So let's move to scintillators. What's a scintillator? A uh, scintillator is a method that can detect uh, X-rays or high-energy ionizing radiation uh, by a material. Scintillator um, has uh, intrinsic properties of luminescence, so if you radiate the surface of scintillator, uh, the energy is converted into photons that are in a visible range of the spectrum and then can, then can be detected by let's say CCD or CMOS camera. There are different types of scintillators uh, and also uh, they have different uh, characteristics. We are going to talk about single crystal scintillators today, but for imaging we would also speak about LPE scintillators, liquid phase epitax scintillators, and powder scintillators. Unfortunately, these two are quite uh, demanding to process. For LPEs, there are some defects which have a deterioration, a deteriorating effect on the, on the image. And powders, they have grain size which actually scatter the light to worsen the resolution of the system. So what are some key factors of the scintillators? Well, first of all, it's conversion efficiency which exactly tells us how much radiation is converted to the visible light. Uh, the property is called the light yield, and we can speak about several photons per key, one keV radiation. Uh, the other parameter is absorption, which strongly depends on the uh, atomic number of the material of a scintillator, and tells us how much radiation is absorbed and thus converted to the visible light spectra. Uh, second key factor would be X-ray stopping power, which is connected to the length, how much, uh, how much uh, thickness of synthesis you need to stop uh, the uh, X-ray radiation from, uh, from transmission. For imagine, we have to speak about luminescence decay time, which is about several nanoseconds, and also afterglow, which have some effect on the signal. The luminescence decay must be lower than the, the, the rate of the integration of the camera, but it's usually OK. For the afterglow, there might be some problem, because if the afterglow is high, it creates residual light, and it uh, diminishes the picture. Spectral matching is something you need for spectral, uh, spectral matching with the camera because it's great that scintillators that we usually use are connected to CCD, which has its maximum at 500 to 600 nanometers, which are greatly coupled with the uh, quantum efficiency of the, of the sensor. There are also uh, other properties such as chemical stability, which is hygroscopicity, and then spatial resolution. This is what we are actually going to talk about at the end. So there's a, uh, there's a list of several applications that you might be familiar with, such as metal key applications, high energy physics, security check, non destructive analysis, good checks, and other applications, which actually tells us when, where scintillators are uh, used and employed for some functions. 
So you can see that scintillators are basically almost everywhere around us. So what are some materials that exhibit scintillation? Well, today we are going to speak about garnet crystals such as yak, which is dealt with cerium, and also luac, which is dealt with cerium. And we can see that its emission wavelength is about 550 nanometers, which is great for coupling it with a CCD. Also, they are non-hygroscopic, so they are very chemically stable. Their, their photon yield is about 20 to 30 photons per keV, and decay time is pretty low for imaging. There are different types of scintillators, as you can see from the table, but you can, you, can, uh, you can see that the emission wavelength is usually somewhere to the UV um, part of the spectra, which is not good for CCDs or CMOS coupling. And also the hygroscopicity of some materials, such as cesium iodide, for example. So let's see uh, Luac and Yag. So these are uh, these yellow scintillators, or the scintillation em emission wavelength is in the uh, yellowish and greenish part of the spectra. What are, these, uh, what are their common features? First of all, they are single crystals. So it means that if you manufacture a very thin screen, they provide very high resolution imaging because there is no scattering inside. Uh, they have a great match, spectral match with a CCD, short decay times, thermostability, which is, which is great because if you, if you need to use in vacuum or something like that, you need to uh, get the... Uh, or the heat from the scintillator, so the heat will not stain the scintillator. Uh, they are chemically stable, so they are non-hygroscopic, and also their radiation hardness is 10 power to 14 grays, which is very high. These can be manufactured actually on different configurations, such as a fiber optic plate, or they can be fixed in a frame. So these scintillators can then be coupled by various wa ways to a uh, detector. Uh, let's switch to the next slide to see what some future outlook can be. So we are constantly looking for finding uh, new scintillators, especially ultra-thin screens, which would provide very high resolution. This resolution can be really very high, even below uh, one micron. Uh, then higher efficiency, this is connected with uh, the light yield, so we need to get more photons out of scintillators to have higher signal on our detector. Uh, higher stopping power, it's something which is very interesting for high radiation, and also lower decay and afterglow, because afterglow, as I said, is connected to the uh, residual radiation, and it will have a diminishing effect on the image quality. So uh, actually, what, uh, what can we actually do to uh, avoid this project defect? We can have pure materials, which is always a question, or we can condope them with different materials that will prevent it from radiation. So we are actually searching for new materials that can be, pro that can be made down to ultra thin screens. And this is something which is very demanding. We need a lot of background, a lot of research, but we believe it can be done to provide the best resolution in magic. Uh, at the end, I would like to ask a question. Have you ever heard or have you ever used synthetic screens by Criter? The answers, the options are yes or no, and you have 30 seconds to answer. And I would like to also encourage you to ask questions at the end of the presentation. If you have anything on mind that 
requires our attention, we'd be happy to give you some answer. And we can maybe discuss in detail somewhere in the future. So hope, uh, I hope that everybody has, uh, has had enough time to answer. So let's hear the results. So as you can see, there's a lot of, a lot of people attending conference which are not familiar with Creature, which is, which is quite sad for, for everybody because I think that our screens are great for imagining. And I will give it a try, and you'll see. So thank you for answering the questions. And I'll uh, give a word to Colin to continue with the presentation. Sorry about that, bit of a uh, sound uh, flaw. Uh, thanks very much, Gary, uh, uh, for the overview and uh, the background on the scintillator and uh, future technology. Uh, we're, we're going now is actually to look at the, the back end, the detector solutions. Uh, specifically, we'll be uh, looking at the Sila 5.5 HF, which is based upon a new technology that's coming to the market, which is uh, the scientific CMOS. So, so uh, a lot of people will be aware of what a CMOS camera is. The scientific CMOS uh, is a little bit uh, different and has brought new capabilities into this market. So we also make uh, a range of other cameras, and we'll go into the next screen and we'll talk about uh, how they apply and uh, the kind of market we see. Uh, the first thing to show here, obviously, is here's a picture of uh, the camera, more importantly, uh, showing the definition and uh, the quality of image that's attainable using the detection, so the high spatial detection available. So when we make cameras, and we make a wide range of high-end scientific cameras, uh, normally we uh, produce CCD and FDMOS cameras for what we describe as a higher energy detection. And by higher energy, we're just simply talking about energies above the visible. And as Yuri covered earlier, that's looking at anything from 10 EV up to 100 KV. What we're trying to indicate with this uh, graph is uh, the kind of spread of energies that can be seen. With the green, we're indicating a direct detection. And then clearly, uh, later on, you can see the scintillator coming into play more. So uh, Yuri has a very good presentation at the end, and he'll be showing the joining together of a scintillator technology with uh, the detector technology. So the graph here is to give you indication. The green is showing what a standard CCD will do, and uh, the blue on the top of the graph is representing where the scintillator starts coming into play. So it's just to give you a kind of broad feel for how and where those technologies are coming into play. Uh, so if we go on to the next graph, let's deal directly with the CCD S CMOS description and see how we can identify uh, the, the difference and why the S CMOS is bringing uh, a, a new ability into this market. So if I, uh, sorry, I seem to have paused slightly. Hopefully, we can move on to slide 14. That seems to have lag than my uh, so uh, so in slide uh, 14 what we're trying to show is what the scientific CMOS is bringing it's bringing a unique uh, capability if you look at a CCD structure you have uh, effectively limitations where you can maybe choose a fast readout but you'd have to have a small effective feed of you or you could go for a wide dynamic range but you'd lose resolution. What the sample CMOS brings is a different structure. 
it brings the ability to have all of these key aspects of a detector in one camera. So here we can see the effects of that. If we look at the uh, list, we have extremely low noise down to one electron, rapid frame rates up to 100 frames per second of the full frame, a wide dynamic range. Now, effectively, this is electron before we get the scintillator, but it, it's a very effective way of moving the charge of up to 33,000 to one. High resolution, which is obviously critical, as we'll go into and Yuri will explore later on with a large field of view of 5.5 megapixels. It's able to do that because it's a different structure. So if you look at the diagram on the top right, what you should see is effectively a charge entering at the same time, so uh, a higher energy photon going into either the CMOS structure or the CCD structure is moved differently. And this different in how the transportation of the charge happens allows you to have this difference in performance. So by having this different uh, performance, uh, Structure, sorry, we can get this uh, uh, better performance. So if I look at the CCD, the charge enters into the pixel and then is effectively clocked down and then out along the circuit. So it takes that individual proton a long time to move through the clock down and along. And that is the effective frame rate. So most CCDs are working in the regime of uh, four or five frames per second. If we move to the CMOS structure, it enters into effectively the pixel, but then can be read out through a very channel immediately. So you, you, you no longer have to clock the charge all the way through the surface of the sensor, but you're able to bring it in and move it. So that is a CMOS structure. So what is a scientific CMOS? All scientific CMOS brings is the effective linearity of response for the CCD-like qualities to a CMOS structure. So what we've developed is effectively a CCD performance in a CMOS structure. So that gives us all of the advantage of fast clocking and the large field of view, which we then want to maximize. So if we move to the next slide, we find we need to deal with how do we get the light from the scintillator or from uh, the matter you're looking at into the camera. So we have to make sure we have a highly efficient, high resolution throughput. And we do this by focusing on our optical uh, design. And we do that by ensuring we have a high throughput. We, we choose uh, fibers with a direct coupling, so that means there's only a single fiber. It's got a high 80 to 20 core ratio. It's maximizing the light throughput. It's minimizing the crosstalk. The crosstalk is stray light or light that's uh, not where you want it to be. And it's done through a EMA. Design. And we also have a resolution on the fiber, uh, 128 line pairs per millimeter, using a three micron channel fiber design. This is all with obviously zero gross or shear distortion. So when we're talking about that, what we're talking about is effectively ensuring that the image is not corrupted by being spatially moved or uh, uh, displaced. So all of that leads to a high throughput, high resolution system. We then move to what, what does that mean for the final uh, detector that is put behind the scintillator? Well, it means then we have a high frame rate, large field of view. So here we're talking 16 by 14 millimeters. We can also expand this by putting a higher uh, taper on. Uh, we have the single fiber design. We have high spatial resolution. We have the low read noise. And then we move on to the capabilities we want to bring on top of that. So we develop a detector which is running fast. It's efficient at the transfer of the light. But we also need to bring more to that because what we want it to be is a flexible tool. So we use a modular scintillator coupling. So when we look at the actual optical performance of the camera, this before we put or couple anything on, we can show that we have a nice, efficient, and uh, effective design. Uh, we do this simply by looking at a USAF 1951 uh, target. And here you can see all we're doing is we're looking at uh, the resolving power test target, uh, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. And we are able to focus into the central region and the cutout uh, in the right is effectively looking at the central region where we're able then to do 
have measurement of the line pairs per millimeter. And as you can see, you're still getting fairly good definition down to these uh, levels. So all this is about is creating an efficient transfer mechanism for uh, the light that is being generated in the layer. So we're trying to match the efficiency and spatial resolution of the camera with the high quality uh, simple layers that are being supplied by Crytor. So we don't want to effectively be limiting the efficiency and resolution of the system. Uh, so that's fairly straightforward. What we then do to give the customer the uh, ability and the, uh, the tool to their hand of uh, modulating or correcting. Uh, if someone could move to slide 18, uh, what we've done is we've created a modular front end. So the design is to enable uh, at the user end the ability to swap out simulators or brilliant windows. When would you want to do that? Well, Jerry, I think we'll cover it to some extent. It just is when you're going to change energies, or you want to change the effective resolutions, the throughput. So you put the ability at the point of use to change the camera. As you can see, it's a fairly straightforward system. Obviously, the beryllium window on the front is uh, to act as a light shield to remove visible light and allow uh, a capture of the uh, uh, the desired energies or higher energies. But all we're doing is delivering that capability of the camera to uh, to the user. So it's a bit flexibility uh, from uh, the the user point of view, and it's a key aspect of all of our doors camera designs. So uh, if before I finish up, I just say this is a brief overview, and we're just trying to cover. Uh, some of the aspects of a specific product of Andor. If you look or want more information, please feel free to go to Andor's website, uh, specifically Learning Academy, or any of the other information. You'll find there's quite a lot of information that you can uh, peruse at your level. Uh, so to finish off, what I would like to do is ask uh, another question, following on from Yuri, just to get uh, a feel for where you sit is uh, if we could put the poll question up. We're just, uh, to, it's an interesting conversation from our point of view. Uh, what is more important to you? Would it be high resolution? Should we be looking to improve resolution? Or is it high throughput for an indirect detector? So something that's using simulators to convert into uh, the detector system as we see. You know, we're just getting a feel. Where do you feel what's well, more important? High resolution, high throughput. And the same thing as uh, Yuri uh, said, if we could take 30 seconds uh, to have a think about it, and we just try and gather that information. So it's it's trying to make it a bit binary, but hopefully, uh, hopefully there's uh, some strong preferences, and we'll see uh, where the majority of you feel uh, the improvement would lie. Okay, so high resolution, which considering the title of uh, the uh, presentation should not be too much of a surprise. Uh, okay, so now we've talked about simulators and we've talked about the camera. I'd like to hand back to Yuri and we'll see kind of some real world uh, work that's been done using our detector and uh, the simulators from Crytor. If I could pass to you, Yuri. Thank you, Colin, for the presentation. So uh, Colin had a great presentation about Zyla, about Zyla, which is which has fiber optic input, and we have we had an honor to actually test it with our simulators to see what the spatial resolution would be. So first of all, we have to speak about the spatial resolution, what it actually is. So the spatial resolution is the ability to resolve or discern details of certain size in the image. So on the left-hand side, you can see a picture how it actually works. If you have two um, small, um, small um, par particles, for example, lines, if they are too close together, they would not be resolved 
due to the uh, optical system tr transmission because if the object has if you have, if you have the object which has 100% contrast the optical uh, system will not transmit the contrast so we can actually speak about two factors the resolution in micrometers but also where to see all contrast we need certain contrast to see the details in the image what are some limiting factors so first of all it's the optics we have different coupling of scintillator to a camera and the optics would have certain effect on the image then also we have to speak about a scintillator uh, there are effects such as the thickness of a scintillator for example that will have effect on the image as you will see and also the detector plays its role in the imaging because it has a certain pixel size which is defined so it will actually define the smallest point of the image you can see and then there's um, different uh, factors such as noise etc so the units are usually line pairs per millimeters so you need some line pairs which is black and white paired together and the number of line pairs per millimeter which tell you where the resolution of the system is you can also use different units such as microns which is in the spatial domain which we are actually used to so let's see what is the best um, characterization of the optical system uh, we spoke about uh, resolution and contrast so we need to put these two together so if you if you use uh, so-called modular transfer function MTF where uh, it's a graph where on the x-axis we have spatial frequency in line pairs per millimeter such as in the number of these pairs per millimeters and the y-axis contrast in percent we can actually say uh, how good the system is we are usually aiming at contrast about 10 percent which is somewhat sufficient to see the details in the image so how to measure MTF practically well there are two ways as Colin pointed out there are certain patterns it's USAF for visible light but for x-ray we need GEMA x-ray test chart which has which has a clear number of pairs which will be imaged by the system and by um, seeing the image and getting the parameters of the image we can see how many actually uh, line pairs will be visible in the image or uh, the other option would be indirect measurement which is usually conducted by slanted edge technique which is very popular and also it has been used uh, with cameras with scanners with almost all imaging devices so let's see what the slanted edge technique is about where it's actually characterized or defined by ISO 12233 uh, it's about electronic still picture imaging and it tells us how to measure the MTF of the system so we need a slanted edge target image we need to image it and then do some processing of the signal where the implementation uh, could be uh, the implementation could be done in MATLAB such as a script by Dr. Burns who developed a script that is able uh, to uh, count line pairs per millimeter from the image so by imagine the slant edge we actually derive edge, um, edge spread function we, took, we take derivative to have line spread function and then by Fourier transfer we have modular function which is the final uh, verdict on the system so let's talk about experimental setup we actually used uh, we use the slanted edge technique as I said uh, with an x-ray works tube which has operation voltage between 20 to 160 kV there are uh, optional anodes they can be copper molybdenum or tungsten 
and the power on the target can be about 10 watts. Uh, this yields to spot size, or the best spot size would be uh, below 1 microns, which is actually good for imaging because uh, the finite spot size will affect the resolution of the system. So a very a small spot size is great for imaging, and it can be, it can be done. And this uh, system provides for chromatic cone beam. So if you put a sample somewhere between the detector and the X-ray source, it will be magnified. So you need to avoid this magnification by putting the edge on top of an imaging screen, which is coupled by fiber optics to Zyla HF. And for a slanted edge, we use a modernum edge of 50 microns, and we tested different scintillators in a range from 30 microns to 500 microns or 200 microns. These were freestanding scintillators, but we also have had a chance to test the scintillator, which is glued to uh, fiber optics, which will be coupled to another fiber optic input of the xyla. After we measured these images, we did to do some processing, which would be background and flash field correction, and then uh, the processing in MATLAB to get the MTF of the system. So let's see. There are some preliminary, preliminary results. So on the left-hand side, you can see uh, the flat edge, the image, and uh, the variation of the contrast, the edge spread function, which can be uh, easily get from the image. On the right hand side, you can see line spread function, which is the derivative of the expert function. And actually, its thickness, or the SVHM, will tell you what the resolution of the system is. So uh, for example, this one was measured on a sample of LUAG uh, of 30 microns with X-ray radiation at 40 keV on a copper target. So we actually use the branch traveling and K alpha of copper. And it was uh, integrated by Andrew Zyla for five seconds. So by taking uh, the Fourier transformation of the line spread function, as I said, we received the result, which is the spatial frequency response. So on the x-axis is the spatial frequency, and on the y-axis is, uh, is the contrast, as I pointed out. So one means 100% of contrast. And we actually uh, use the 10% uh, value, which is resolution about 39 line pulse per millimeter, where the actually uh, cutting frequency would be somewhere like if the if the system would be uh, if the system were uh, without uh, defects and the optics could transfer everything would be the Nyquist frequency so you can compare our spatial frequency what we obtained to the Nyquist frequency which would be a sampling frequency of the detector so it's 39 line pulse per millimeters so. What about the other scintillators? OK, let's see. Uh, we have a graph. And it actually shows uh, the relation between resolution and line pulse per millimeters to thickness, which is, uh, which is not a good uh, evaluation for us, because it will be reciprocal. Value 1 over resolution is better. So we can speak about line per width in, in microns. And we can see, actually, that uh, the line per width is, um, is linear related to the thickness. If we speak about scintillators between 30 to 200 microns. So there's a linear dependency. Uh, Let's see some sample pictures, what we actually got. Uh, so
So this is this is a, an image made by X-ray radiation of 70 keV with a tungsten target with 2 watt power on the target and by Xyla. So this is a comparison between uh, between resolution of two uh, different thicknesses of seed glaciers. On left right uh, on the left side we can see 550 micron yak on FOP and it's clearly clearly visible. There, it's not blurred actually. You can see 50 percent of the original image. But on the other hand, if you switch to a thicker simulator, you get worse a worse resolution. I will get back to the slide. Let's see. Uh, the 50 micron uh, simulator on FOB would have line pair width about 30. Is that green point in the graph below the red line, and that a 200 uh, micron thick scintillator would be about 160 micrometers when we speak about line width, which is equivalent to 6 to 6.3 uh, line per millimeter. So you can see a clear dis uh, clear difference here in the graph, and was actually corresponds to the image quality. What would you expect from from imaging? So let's get back to the wasp. So it's here. So you can see it's a little better. So if you use a thin scintillator, you will have better uh, spatial resolution. So let's let's go to your summary here. So first of all, what we actually measured with Xyla is that uh, the line pair width each resolution microns is proportional to the thickness of the scintillators. So it means if you have a scintillator of, let's say, 100 micron, you can expect resolution in line pairs in the thickness of these two line pairs, or, or, or the thickness of these two lines of the line pair of about 100 microns with YAC or LUAC. The highest resolution achieved was over 33 line pairs per millimeter, which is uh, better than 30 microns, and it's uh, the same as Colin showed in the graph that Xyla has resolution over 33 LP, uh, LP to millimeter. So it, uh, it actually tells us that the scintillator, if it's, it's very thin, is not a limitation of the system. It has some effect, but it will not deteriorate the resolution that much if the screen is very thin. Uh, there were two lines, so we could see that uh, YAG, let's, let's, let's see, it will be easier for you, is slightly better. So. Uh, YAG is the red line, so you can see that it's lower, lower in the graph, so it means you have more line pairs per millimeters from YAG. Uh, but we actually have to uh, confirm that we use polychromatic radiation, so it means that it's absorbed in different thicknesses. So by this, LUAC is actually favored by higher integral conversion efficiency for energies over 20 keV, which is due to the polychromatic X-ray source. Uh, thus, you will have a higher signal of in the, on the image. And also, we actually confirmed that the X-ray spot is small enough to maintain resolution between 20 to 100 keV. As I said, uh, the X-ray spot was about one micron, and that that's it. The resolution is more than one micron of the system, so it means that the uh, X-ray spot didn't play any role in that. So, uh, thank you, uh, thank you for 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 having for having this presentation and I will uh, I will switch to, to Linda. 
Uh, thank you, Jerry and Colin, for your terrific presentation. Now begins the Q&A portion of this webinar. The first question I have here is, um, is the fiber optic permanently coupled to the uh, SCMOS sensor? Sorry, yes, I can probably answer that one. Uh, yes, the fiber is currently bonded uh, to the sensor. But we have actually got modules and capability of putting other fibers on, but the, the, the camera has got direct bonded, so yes. Um, uh, Colin, I, I had a little uh, trouble hearing what you were saying. I think that the connection was not good. I was wondering if you if you wouldn't mind repeating it, um, just in yep. case others no problem. Couldn't, couldn't hear the answer. Sorry, uh, the fiber is directly bonded onto the sensor, and that is a permanent bond. Uh, we offer other fibers on top, uh, so you're able to uh, uh, effectively have another fiber you can uh, apply onto that. But the camera core is uh, bonded and is a permanent bond. Well, may I add something? Yes, please. Okay, so so you can actually couple the scintillator just by pressing it on the top of the fiber optics of the camera with using some liquid, uh, uh, liquid or something like that, or you can use a fiber uh, fiber optic plate glue to scintillate and then uh, press it against against the fiber optic input. So we actually confirmed that if, if it's these two options, we actually give you the same resolution. The FOP, which is added to the system, will actually not have uh, effect that is measurable to the, to the resolution of the system. Okay, thank you. Um, Another question I have here is, is it possible to image an object larger than the scintillator, given that you can't focus x-rays? Well, actually, it's, it's a good question. Uh, the scintillator uh, actually works as, as an imaging plate. So the object must be smaller than the scintillator itself, or it must be uh, measured by some parts. If the object is bigger than the scintillator, you need to do some, some, some small images and then put it to a bigger image at the end. It's actually not possible. So the answer would be, would be the object must be lo smaller or you need to do some uh, partial imaging. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, what solutions do you suggest to couple scintillators and camera detectors together? Well, there are basically, let's say, two solutions. The first one would be using uh, Microsoft Objective to couple uh, the scintillator to, uh, to a CCD camera, or the second would be uh, using FOP, as we are talking about it today, so we can put it on top of the FOP and directly image it on scintillator, use FOP to, to, to light, uh, to uh, guide the light to the sensor. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, what are typical thicknesses of the high resolution scintillators? Well, actually, uh, it's a tricky question. It's a tricky question. We can we can start, let's say, from five microns of thickness for Yak and Luak to say one uh, uh, one hundred microns for imaging or millimeters. But it has an effect on the resolution. For the great greatest resolution, you need as thin scintillator as you can. So five microns would be the best. But on the other hand. If the scintillator plate is um, not thick enough, it will not absorb all the radiation, so you, you will lose uh, the signal. So you have to think about uh, um, signal-to-noise ratio and balance the thickness of the scintillator and uh, the absorption of the scintillator to get the best result. And it depends on the application, which are actually different. 
Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, can scintillators be coupled to systems that operate at uh, temperatures above 80 degrees Celsius? 80 degrees Celsius? Mm -hmm. uh, well, actually, scintillators, uh, our scintillators, galnets, are, uh, uh, are, are very stable with the temperature, so 80 degrees uh, and the input would not be a problem. The melting point would be somewhere 2,000 degrees, so 80 degrees will work with a simulator. Okay, um, thanks. Do you have scintillators for detecting thermal neutrons? Where, um, well, for, for, let's say, for thermal neutrons, you need a layer which, which will we should convert uh, the neutron radiation to, to alpha particles. It could be some lithium fluoride, for example, a very thin, uh, very thin layer of lithium fluoride on top of scintillators. So uh, the neutron is converted to uh, alpha particles, which are then converted to visible light and thus visible on the CCD. Okay. Um, thanks. Do you uh, lose light when you press a scintillator fiber plate to the fiber on the camera? Well, I'm sorry, I didn't have uh, a question. Do you lose light when you press a scintillator fiber plate to the fiber on the camera? Well, I think Colin want, wanted to add something. Yeah, so um, it, it's... It, it, uh, uh, a good question again, uh, because you're, with the scintillator, you don't really, because you're, I think you're collecting, uh, you do have the, the danger of two optical surfaces, so you, you have light being lost. If you get a mismatch between fiber plates, then you can get effectively a loss there. But I think as uh, Yuri covered in his uh, uh, report on the testing, they actually did use a uh, scintillator fiber onto the plate. I didn't see uh, a loss. Uh, sorry, the, it, it contained the, the resolution. Uh, you may get a slight loss in uh, the frequency. This is one of the reasons why we specifically design uh, a few fibers so we have as few surfaces as possible because uh, one of the, the aspects is to make sure we uh, don't compromise the frequency. I don't know if you want to add on to it. Okay. Um, thanks. Uh what um, what type of cooling does the camera use? Uh, the the camera is effectively a healthy air cooler, and it uh, just uses a uh, air cooling to its minus uh, sorry zero. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, Colin. I'm having a little bit of a hard time um, hearing you. Oh, All right, I'll, I'll I'll try to get uh, the camera is uh, a healthy air cool and uses an air cooling. So it's cooled uh, effectively at fan and reaches a cooling temperature of zero uh, to be thermally stable. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, how is the light output of the scintillator related to the X-ray radiation flux? Well, it's uh, a question for me, I guess. Uh, well, if you have higher flux, you have higher uh, scintillation effect, and there's linear correlation. So the higher flux, the higher the scintillate, scintillating uh, output will be. Okay. Um, question here is, uh, how much does the camera cost? Uh, probably the simplest answer, if you, if you uh, uh, contact Andor, we can give you uh, pricing for your region. So it will be it will be in the currency of the region. So rather than cause confusion by giving numbers out, if you just contact Andor afterwards, we can give you a price. Okay, great. Um, what is the light collection uh, efficiency of the taper? How does it compare to lens coupling? Well, um. Well, it's a good question. 
and it uh, it's about numeric aperture. So uh, the efficiency of fiber optics is uh, higher because the numerical aperture is also higher. For optics, for, for Microsoft objectives, you can have aperture about, let's say, 0.5, but for FOP, you get a numerical aperture of 1, or almost 1. You can collect basically everything you can get. Okay. Um. Thanks. Uh, let me see here. Um, what would be the theoretical limit of resolution of the system? Well, uh, um, I think, I think oh, sorry, uh, the answer is that uh, it's, it's going to be limited uh, by the pixel. Fundamentally, it will be a pixel because uh, we'll not see ideas. Uh, so you'll be limited by that. Presently, uh, the optical uh, ops uh, are the limit or on the edge of the limit. And I think, Jerry, unless you want to go into slightly more detail, Jerry. Well, as you said, Colin, it's about the pixel size or the twice of a pixel size. It depends on the definition. But uh, here, uh, the spatial frequency or the highest spatial frequency is the Nyquist frequency, which is at the uh, 0.5 pixel size. So, so, and also there's some diffraction limit, which is given by really criteria, which would be uh, the wavelength over the numeric aperture and some factor of 0.6 or 1, that will give you that the theoretical limit would be below the, uh, 1 micron. But because of the sampling frequency is actually lower, means that the pixel is bigger, and there is one-to-one -one magnification it will be given by, uh, by the camera. But on the other hand, we have to say that uh, the limit uh, of imaging, in the, of X-ray imaging that has been achieved is about 0.5 microns. But it's a different concept than, than the FOP. But on the other hand, with the FOP, you have uh, better light collecting, and there are some advantages of the system. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I'm afraid that's all the time that we have. I just wanted to, to thank you, um, Jerry and Colin, for your terrific presentation, and thank you participants for being a great audience. Be sure to check CNN or CNN Online for information on the next edition of CNN Webinars. Thank you, On24, for techno technology and production services. And thank you, Andrew and Kreider, for the sponsorship that made this interactive webcast possible. For CNN Webinars, I'm Linda Wang. Goodbye.